Hey, this is Chris Franco, and you are listening to Compound Money Quietly, the CMQ Investing Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. We are entering a very unique time in the stock market because we are starting to see the real world where stocks don't just go up. Last week, my precious, my beloved shares of Viacom CBS went down 50% one week. On Friday, if I had taken the, <laughs> taken the advice of my favorite friends on TikTok and bought the dip, because that's what you do. If I did that on Friday, I'd have lost 27% of my money just on Friday, light work. Now, the good news is the stuff that I'm talking about in these episodes, I'm actually applying. So when I bought my shares of Viacom CBS in August, 2020, I treated it like I was buying the entire business. And through my analysis, I felt that Viacom CBS was undervalued relative to its intrinsic value. I took a safe position, about 2% of my portfolio, and I watched my shares go up 320% in less than eight months. I had a pep in my step. I was walking around New York City with my COVID mask and a cup of coffee, feeling like the king of Wall Street. And I'd see people and they'd walk by and they'd say, hey, how you doing? And I'd pour my coffee in their face and say, I'm the king of Wall Street. You don't talk to me. Have you heard of Viacom? Yeah, I'm in that. <laughs> Here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about what the heck happened to Viacom CBS. That's first and foremost. Then we're gonna discuss what I think is probably the most interesting part of this show. I took the wise words of about six of the greatest investors of all time, but I wanted to see what all of them had said about when is the right time to sell a stock? When do you sell? And in compiling that and synthesizing that information, I think we have something really interesting to talk about. And it's informed my logic or my reasoning about what I'm gonna do with my Viacom CBS shares. So let's just get right into it. This quote comes from the New York Times. The stock was as high as $100 on Monday. By the close of trading on Friday, it had fallen to just over $48, a drop of more than 51% in less than a week. There's no better way to say it. The company's stock tanked. MarketWatch says the stock got caught up in the momentum trade in media stocks this year amid frenzied optimism over direct-to-consumer streaming opportunities, even as Wall Street grew increasingly skeptical. That momentum trade led to Viacom CBS shares rocketing to a year-to-date gain of 169.3% through Monday. And then, as the New York Times said, it tanked. What happened? I'm not claiming to know all the potential causes of the sell-off, but here's a couple of the big ones. First is that the management of Viacom decided they were going to issue more shares. Uh, this comes from Variety. Viacom CBS announced the pricing of 20 million shares of its Class B common stock at $85 per share and 10 million shares of its Series A mandatory convertible preferred stock at $100 per share. The company says it expects to use the net proceeds, blah, 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 blah. Here's the point. This sent a signal to the larger market that, hey, you know that gut feeling you had that Viacom CBS shares are way overpriced right now? Yeah. Well, guess what? What? Viacom CBS management agrees, hey. <laughs> and they're trying to capitalize on it. That's what I'm talking so about. So that just kind of backfired. That got things kicked off here. But then this happened, and this comes from Yahoo Finance. Quote, a liquidation of holdings at several major investment banks with ties to Tiger Club Archegos Capital Management LLC contributed to an unseen daily decline Friday in shares of stocks, including Viacom CBS. Shares of the media conglomerate Viacom CBS fell 26%. Remember, that's just on Friday. The degree of the declines was unprecedented and occurred in an otherwise orderly market. But this brings up that warning, which is if you've just been chasing momentum stocks because you're just used to them going up, recalibrate. Not only can anything happen, I know this is not just your everyday moment where you have you have management say, hey, we're gonna issue more shares and, and basically tell everyone, yeah, our stock's overvalued. And then you have a big sell-off from a hedge fund that could have happened for a bunch of different reasons that have nothing to do with that. Then you have the momentum of retail traders and potentially institutional traders, I'm not totally sure, following that and selling off. Because what happens is, and I'm simplifying this, but a lot of times when you've made money in a stock, you kind of get used to that being you know, your money. Like, yeah, that's my net worth now. And when you start to see it go away, even if it's so far up that 
you know, you don't even deserve it. Like I don't deserve 320% in eight months. I mean, I'll take it, but I didn't expect it to stay like that. Again, I'm a long-term shareholder generally. And, you know, just, I figured there would be some correction. I didn't expect it like this, but it happened and I was prepared for it. But when you start to see those profits or those unrealized gains start to just disappear, it feels like someone's got their hand in your pocket and they're just robbing you. And you're like, I'm losing my money right now. It's like watching someone take all your money as if it was in cash form, but let's pretend. They take all your money in cash, they stand outside on Broadway in Manhattan and start making it rain on taxi cabs. You know, that's what it feels like. And you just wanna stop the bleeding. You're like, I'm hemorrhaging money right now. Let me stop, let me just take this game. Let me just, you know, I just wanna feel like I did something right. Because you start to have all these irrational thoughts about, oh my God, I'm never gonna make this back. And this was, I had it so good and look what I did. And you just don't wanna have that feeling of, hey, I was an idiot. But if you apply what we talked about in the last episode, you know, where you understand what you bought, you're not overly phased by that stuff. Remember Charlie Munger said he's seen his shares in Berkshire Hathaway go down 50% three times in his lifetime. The question I have to ask myself is, what should I do? Should I sell? Even with that drop last week, I'm still up 100%. You know, whoop-de-woo, I'm not, you know, patting myself on the back in all seriousness. Short-term performance doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot, but you know, it's, it's done well. And I'm happy with that because my goal long-term is to do a little bit better than average over my investing lifetime. That in itself is gonna be really challenging, but that's what I'm set out to do. And so this is contributing to doing better than average and, and some, so it's cool. So what have the greatest investors of all time said about the right time to sell? When is it? Is there a right time to sell? What should be factoring into your decision-making? Let's start things off with Warren Buffet, which is what I like to say to people when they ask what I'm interested in doing. I say, yeah, you know, I do this, this, and I actually, I also have a podcast about investing and they cover the greatest investors. Oh yeah, who? Oh, Charlie Munger, Phil Fisher. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, definitely. John Templeton, oh, of course. Uh, Warren Buffet, you know, Howard Marks. I'm just, this is just who I am. Um, I obviously tell them I'm kidding, but it's, it's really funny because um, they're very polite, but it's like, oh my God, he's, he's an idiot, is what they're thinking in their heads. So what did Warren Buffet, what did he have to say about when to sell? And he said that you sell when the business has lost its competitive advantage and or you think the management is bad news. And frankly, I don't know enough about issuing more shares or what all factored into the decisions to do that. And I'm gonna reach out to some friends who might have the answer. Again, this is why I love doing this because it just, anytime I have any sort of gap in my knowledge, it's exposed and I have to figure it out. I will say this, I don't love the fact that they did that. As a shareholder, when they issued more shares, well, that's diluting my shares. You know, I didn't sign off on that. Hey, I'm an owner, I'm, an, I'm entitled here. I love this, it's that ownership attitude because we own a piece of a business. I'm a, hey, I own a piece of this business, you piece of shit. What if I just said that? Would I call an earnings call? Yeah, hi, Chris Franco here. Listen, listen, buddy, I own a piece of this business, you piece of shit. But I wanna learn more about that because that might make me think twice about the management. Maybe the management is bad news. Next up is John Templeton. Johnny boy. I actually recently learned that John Templeton was also a student of Benjamin Graham's, like Warren Buffett. Fun fact. I have a couple different things that John Templeton has said. The best answer for when to sell, John Templeton came up with, was to sell when you have found a much better bargain to replace whatever it is you're holding currently. He also said he never followed the crowd and his philosophy was to buy when most people, including experts, are pessimistic and sell when they are overly optimistic. If he couldn't find a more attractive stock to buy, he would hold on to the stocks he had. Opportunity cost, makes sense. And finally, This is actually a quote. Bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy, and the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. I would ask all of you just to, you know, answer for yourselves, but feel free to let me know what you think or what you came up with. What time period or what period rather are we in now? Are we in skepticism time? Are we on optimism time? Are we in euphoria time? Where are we? Because depending on where you look, you probably find different answers. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Send me an email, 
franco at cmqinvesting.com, F-R-A-N-C-O at cmqinvesting.com. Would love to talk to you. Hit me up. Howard Marks, another one of these legendary investors, great thinker, great writer, says, quote, the time to sell is not now when everyone has a long list of problems and stocks are down 10, 11, 12%. The time to sell is when everyone says, I can't imagine anything that could go wrong. I know I said the time to sell is not now. He, what, this quote was not from now. So just make sure you know that. But Phil Fisher, Billy Boy. Warren Buffett's, I would go on a limb and say his favorite investing author. Fisher's has, Fisher has three reasons for selling. One, if a mistake was made in the original purchase. Two, the stock no longer qualifies with reference to his 15 points. Side note on that, side note, side note, side note. I'm going to be putting together that 15 points in the form of a checklist that you will be able to access on our newsletter. You can access it at cmqinvesting.com or if you just like to type more, it's cmqinvesting.substack.com. Sorry if I keep dropping email addresses and domains, but it's important that you know this. I want you to be able to engage with us and you know we can grow together. Weirdo. Finally, the third thing that Phil Fisher says is a reason for selling is when a more attractive stock is identified. And number four, if you just wake up and you're in a bad mood, just sell that We're hearing a theme here, opportunity cost. Because if you sell, well, what are you gonna do with the money? Seth Klarman, amazing investor. I'm, I'm starting to learn a lot more about him. I'm gonna finish off with this quote from one of his letters to shareholders where he actually kind of answers that question. Quote, we will not stray from our rigid value investment discipline. We buy absolute bargains when they become available and sell when they are no longer bargains. Okay, well, I have one more here. Peter Lynch, I didn't write out his full quote. I watched a video. Peter Lynch makes a great point. First and foremost, you gotta remember why you bought the stock. Something I like to do, and I actually do this personally, before I buy anything, <laughs> before I buy a stock, I'm not like a pair of socks, I will write down like a paragraph of why I'm buying it. It's really simple, but it forces you to slow down and actually put your thoughts out. And then if it does well or doesn't do well, you can go back and understand why you did it because it's really about the process and your thinking process. You know, the results can, can stray from the quality of your thinking. I find this just helps a lot. I recommend doing this. I think Warren Buffett also says too, but don't listen to Warren Buffett, right? Listen to me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy. But Peter Lynch says, know why you bought the stock. And also what inning you're in. He uses this baseball analogy. You know, it could be the fact that a, a company is entering maybe a maturing phase and there's not a lot of upside in growth and you've ridden most of the growth up to that point. I don't think that's the case with Viacom CBS. There's a big international opportunity for uh, streaming video on demand in the next four years. And I think they'll do pretty well. If you wanna know my analysis of Viacom CBS, I'm gonna put that together on the newsletter. So just a heads up. Now, what would Charlie Munger say? I don't have to look at any notes for this. Charlie Munger is an opportunity cost guy. So if there's something better that you can do with the money, well, then do it. But he'd also probably say there's huge mathematical advantages of doing nothing because we have to think about the tax implications. Short-term, I'm paying short-term capital gains tax. That's a big bill. If I hold on to it for a year longer, my tax bill goes down pretty substantially. So I should probably figure out where I need to be in order to make holding it still better than what it would be if I sold right now and paid the higher tax rate. Now, one decision you should not make is buy something because it's been going up, especially if you haven't attempted to value that business. So let's say you take a position in Viacom CBS, it's 10% of your portfolio. And I was reading some stuff on one of these uh, stock forums where people in February were talking about jumping in Viacom CBS. You know, if you went down, like I said earlier, the most extreme example, if you went down 50%, you have to make 100% back to get even. Think about it, if you go from 100 down to 50, that's a loss of 50%. But to get to 50 back to 100, you have to go up 100%, you have to double. So be very careful with taking losses. You don't wanna take losses. I mean, there's always volatility, but something like this, if you're not aware of why you bought it, you didn't think it through, if you didn't value the business, if you're just trying to play this momentum game, it's eventually gonna come to an end. And that's something that I really don't want anyone who listens to this collectively as a, as a frankly, a community of investors. You know, we have to be almost like a support group. It's very tempting to do this stuff. It's extremely tempting. But you see one of these charts and it looks like, you know, a Tony Hawk vert ramp. 
it's very appealing. You know, hey, let me just, it's Viacom, it's streaming. I watch things on, I watch things on screens. Like this is, this is going up. And, you know, in the many cases, it might keep going up and you're fine and you don't ever learn the lesson. But let this be a preview of what can happen when people have, I'm talking institutions have liquidity, liquidity issues, when people just get spooked and a lot of people sell off quickly. There's a lot of reasons here, but you got to know what you're holding. Otherwise, you're bound to act irrational. And worst of all, you're, you're going to lose money. And we don't want that to happen. This is compound money quietly. We don't want to interrupt the compounding process. With all that said and done, my name is Chris Franco. I appreciate you listening. Charlie Munger says, the best thing a human being can do is help another human being know more. Help someone else know about compound money quietly. If you learned something from this episode, send it their way. There's lots of awesome content for you at cmqinvesting.substack.com. You can just go to cmqinvesting.com. Of course, follow at Charlie Munger Quotes on Instagram. Send me an email. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for listening. We'll talk soon.